What's up, everybody? Want to welcome you to the check in with your man Big O. I know it's been a minute since I checked in, and usually I'm checking in in like, you know, casual attire. But today I'm all dressed up here on the set. You know what I'm saying? We got a very special guest, like we say around here, Africa Town and Black Dot. All of our guests are special because you made it in here to the underground. We we've got a young genius in the biz in the building. You know what I'm saying? In in more ways than one. We, we've actually got, um, we'd like to say, one of the graduates from an Africatown ecosystem here, man. We've got uh, Amari Garrett. Yes, sir. How you doing today? I'm doing good, man. All right, fantastic. So Amari is a 2018 graduate of Garfield High School. So you already know, no matter what, he's totally okay with us because he's a bulldog <laughs> through, through and through. Um, he's now down at North Carolina A&T University, home of the Aggies, and the greatest homecoming of all, right, of all time. Yes, sir. Aggie pride. Yes, Aggie pride in the business. Yes, HBCU biz in the business in the building. He's studying computer science down there at uh, at North Carolina A&T, and you know, a, a freshman year, a freshman year in college. Uh, is already up to some exciting things what we'll talk about here. Some of his other accomplishments, though, you know, he was uh, early in on Mind the Block, um, yeah. one, of, one of the Africatown uh, design activities here. And he also just came back from teaching over in Ghana. So, you know what I'm saying? It's been an exciting 12 months uh, for you since um, graduating high school, going yeah. to Ghana to teach, being part of different design um, programs and everything else. And now you're here in Seattle, Again, welcome to the underground. Thank you. Thank you. Fantastic. So first of all, I mean, schools in my, my son, he's in college as well. It's his freshman year at Loyola, yeah. but he's in class in Chicago. Mm -hmm. Why are you here today in Seattle? So, you know, Microsoft had to fly the boy out. Uh, I, I'm applying for the Microsoft Explorer program, which is their college internship program for freshmen and sophomores. And so I applied for that and they decided to bring me out for interviews. I did my interviews today, killed them. So, you know, you might see me there next summer or I might be somewhere else at Google or Twitter. You know, we'll see where 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 the road takes me. But. Uh, all right. I, I, I'm, I'm assuming that this swag that we feel dripping on the set is, is, is very much well deserved. I think that we don't, we don't want to just gloss over the fact that you're a freshman in college. Just, you've only been in school now for what, two or three months, right, yeah. since, since school first started. This is your first year in school, and you, you're actually, all expenses paid, you got flown back out home here uh, to Seattle by yeah. Microsoft. They put you up, nice hotel over in Bellevue, gave yeah. you a per diem and everything for you to interview for an internship this summer. Yeah. And I only bring that up, and, and I'm sure we'll discuss that a bit more um, uh, in our talk today, is that a lot of the career paths that our young people are choosing their freshman year in school, a few months in, they're not getting flown in somewhere to, to, to do a, an internship or something like that. <clears throat> now, clearly, tech is where it's at for you and IT and coding and all these other things I don't really understand, but I do appreciate the final end result because mm -hmm. it brings convenience. But why was that a path for you? So it all started out when I was extremely young. Uh, ever since I was little, I've always been a fan of automotives. So you used to catch me playing with Hot Wheels. I used to have the tracks. Uh, I used to go to the New York International Auto Show every year. And so over time, that developed into my interest in engineering. And one time I actually came to Seattle for, um, actually when I was first moving here. And I went and I stayed a night at a, at a Jewish friend's home, actually. And on that Saturday, he had to leave out early because he had a Lego Robotics uh, workshop that he did. And I was like, dang, that's, that's so cool. I wish I could do something like that. So, you know, I talked to my dad and I was like, since I'm moving out here, I was like, well, is there something like that that I can do in our community? And the answer was no. So what my dad suggested was that I got some friends together and we created a program where we could explore that stuff on our own. And so that's what we did. Uh, we started out with robotics kits and we'd make little robots that we could move around. Uh, then we moved on to Lego Mindstorms. But whenever we would get a break during our uh, weekend sessions, we'd run downstairs and we'd, you know, play games on the computer. So my dad was like, he took us to the side and he said, you know, since you guys are so interested in these video games, why don't you, you know, move a little bit from robotics and learn, well, how can you make video games? And so that's really what started me on my path to coding. And here I am today 
Last, uh, last summer, I actually did an internship at Minecraft over in Redmond. So Minecraft is owned by Microsoft as well. And so I was over there last summer. Uh, today, I just did interviews so that I could work there again next summer. And yeah, moving along. You know, we had a, a guest last week, Carlos Imani, who, mm -hmm. who said something very important. He said that, you know, you f a lot of times people find success when passion meets skill. And it seems like, you know, in, in this case here, you had a passion for, you know, computers and robotics and everything else. And I would have to add in passion, skill, and sometimes guidance because right. your, your father was able to come in and kind of guide and, and put uh, situations in place to be able to meet that passion so you could develop Absolutely. the skill. And so that, um, that exposure. So over the years, as I've grown up, I've always been exposed to the things that I'm interested in. And that's really what kept kept me on this um, on this trajectory. So you know, ever since from at that point when we created the program to 2017, I attended Afrotech, and I was. Let, let me stop you right there, mm -hmm. because now I've heard of Afrotech, mm -hmm. and even via hashtag, we also had Jeremiah Walters in here uh -huh. uh, uh, about two weeks ago, and I heard Afrotech come up. Can you tell us what is Afrotech? What's it all about, quickly? So Afrotech is a tech conference where a bunch of black people get together. That's the easiest way I can put it. A bunch of black people that are in the tech industry get together. Uh, there are several talks uh, done by many of the people that are creating waves, I mean waves in the industry. Um, people like John Henry and Jessica Matthews, who I saw when I went to Afrotech and who are now two of my biggest inspirations. Um, Rodney Williams and many other people. Yeah, man. So okay. I mean, this is this is good to hear that these things are happening. You know what I'm saying? We always hear about conferences and everything else. Um, I know that like CES used to be something that I would follow because that was like it's also kind of like a, a mainstream tech thing for products and everything else. But Afrotech and it's a once a year conference. Yep. And where where did it occur last time that you? Uh, went? When I went last time, it was in San Francisco. So actually, both times that I attended, it was in San Francisco. Right. And if you're a college student, you can actually uh, you should check with your program and, you know, anybody that's in your computer science program or anything like that and check for opportunities to get uh, scholarships. Even Microsoft actually has a scholarship um, where they will pay for you to go to select conferences. Afrotech isn't included, but there are other uh, tech conferences like the Nesby conference, uh, mm -hmm. which they'll pay for you to attend. So definitely opportunities to look out for your, if you're a college student. Now, speaking of opportunities, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> you kind of immersing yourself into this tech life and everything else presented an opportunity for you to teach, you yeah. know, halfway around the world over in Accra, Ghana. Mm -hmm. And this was just a few months ago. Can you tell us a little bit about the experience there in Ghana? One, actually what you were doing on the everyday teaching, but mm -hmm. then also being there in Ghana, the yeah. motherland. Yeah. So, man, when I first touched down, it was just like, it wasn't like some old kneel down and touch the soil, but the first thing that took me back was the fact that every everybody that I looked at was black, and I mean black, like my skin color black, you feel me? And uh, that was just a, a blessing to, to experience because growing up here, uh, you know, between New York and Seattle, you're always the minority, uh, you're always the minority, and to not be the minority is definitely an empowering thing. So between that, um, you know, finding an opportunity to teach at Soronko Academy, which is the computer academy that I, you know, was a teaching assistant at, and uh, just experiencing and making friends in Ghana, it was a, it was a great experience. So um, Soronko Academy actually came about where me and my dad reached out. We were looking around to see what could I do uh, you know, while I was there, how can I make an impact or just be of service? And so we found Soronko Academy, reached out, um, said if, you know, if there's any opportunities for me to help out there, uh, I'd love to be there. And they hit me back, interviewed me, and then they were like, yeah, come on board. Man, you've been doing pretty good at these interviews. You interviewed <laughs> over with Minecraft, you said that worked out, Soronko Academy, that worked out, Microsoft Today, we got our fingers crossed on that. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It's like you're on the path. Now... <clears throat> I mean, this is this is a, a success story thus far, even at a young age. You know what I'm saying? We're claiming success and continued success. It's a success story. Somebody, you know, basically a Garfield High School graduate, you know, you got into tech, 
um, you know, doors are opening for you early on in college. You got a, an opportunity to go overseas and teach and everything else. Now, in, in our community, traditionally, our parents, we do expose, people say that our, our parents don't expose us to a lot of things. Our parents do expose us to a lot of things that, that traditionally have, have they felt that have worked. Right. You know, and that, a lot of sports and, you know, sometimes music and things like that. Yeah. How do you feel, uh, how, what do you, what do you think needs to occur to get more young black boys and girls interested in tech at an early age like um, like you were? Right. I mean, the first thing, of course, is exposure. Like I said, you know, as I was growing up, I always had exposure to the things that I was interested in. Now, my interest was cars, so my mom would take me to the car show every year. But, you know, growing up, depending on who you are, your interest might be, you know, basketball or football. But you're not going to know to look for other things if you never are exposed to it or if no one ever shows you or if you don't see somebody in a position or in a, in a field that you're like, huh, maybe I want to do that. Because a lot of times what happens is, you know, we want to emulate ourselves onto someone else or we want to we see somebody and we're like, wow, I want to be like them. You know, I want to be like 2 Chains or I want to be like LeBron. And if you saw somebody like Ronnie Williams, and you're like, wow, he's really doing great things. I want to be like him. He's running his own company. Uh, I think more of our youth would aspire to uh, more diverse fields like tech. So it sounds like that also people like um, like myself and Africatown Media, we also play a key role in exposure. Um, because when you talk about people like 2 Chains, most people in our community have never met 2 Chains, but through media avenues, they've familiarized themselves. Most have never met an NFL or NBA ball player, right. but through media and imagery, they've been exposed to it. You know, um, when Jeremiah Walters and also Rashad, Rashad Fontenot has a, mm -hmm. a real interesting story, also went to Garfield, you know what I'm saying? He spent some time in jail. He went to a uh, uh, coding boot camp, and it, it automatically launched him to a six-figure income. Mm. And I think that um, if people can understand, like if we're able to put up everyday guys, because there's people who are succeeding in tech, but it's it's not uh, it's not glamorized. Right. So young people aren't seeing that, and young people are emulating what's what's glamorized. Right. I think one of the things we want to be able to do here is bridge the gap where a young kid in the central district can see a success story. Of, of somebody who's who's in tech here and see I'm making half a million dollars a year, living the way that they want to live and everything else. So that might be something that media can also Absolutely. play a part as well, right? Absolutely. Okay, fantastic. So uh, I know you have a lot going on, but somebody mm -hmm. like you seems like that they might have a plan. You know what I'm saying? Maybe a short-term or a long-term plan. Maybe you can share some of your future goals or aspirations with us. Mm -hmm. So my short-term goal is, you know, to keep consistently landing these internships year after year until I graduate, if I graduate, because, you know, young boy might need to make an early exit on an app idea, you know, uh -oh. uh, might, might ball out on a startup, you feel me? But um, that's plan B. But plan A is to continue going through these internships every year. And when I graduate, land a full-time job uh, at one of these large tech companies. But the purpose is for me to gain a uh, better insight into how these uh, software products are being developed um, so that I can then exit and create my own company. Uh, my my vision all the way down the line is to have a company that facilitates the development of smart cities in underdeveloped countries like Ghana, like Nigeria, like um, parts of South Africa and really just all around the African continent because you know, if we're not going to help our people and help build up the motherland, how are we ever going to expect everybody to want to go back, you know? So I want to make sure that these cities can come up, but not just develop in uh, unsustainable ways uh, with emissions that are contributing to climate change, but come up in ways that are, uh, you know, environmentally benign and also ways that, you know, make infrastructure more effective, mm -hmm. help, help governments to, you know, keep track of everything that's going on and find better ways to implement systems and things like that. So. But I think it was Malcolm X who, who said something like, you know, the black man won't be respected until Africa is respected. Absolutely. You know, so it goes hand in hand. So it's very encouraging to hear that that's part of your long-term planning as you know what I'm saying, is to, is to go back to the motherland. And when I, when I was over there, they used to always tell us that, man, you know, we're the tip of the spear over here. Mm -hmm. We're the very tip. You see what I'm saying? Because yeah. we're going to these schools, these colleges, these opportunities. And so it's, it's, it's always um, 
heartwarming for me to hear when someone wants to be able to go back and not go back and bring a book, God go back or whatever, not give somebody a fish, but you know what I'm saying? Exactly. And things that are sustainable. Um, Bringing it uh, back to Seattle, you know, there was um, some stats that were put out by the Seattle Times about a month ago, and it talked about... um, the, the household income of mm-hmm. families here in Seattle. And it comes to find out that the the average white household income or the median is $105,100. Fantastic. Black, it's 42500 mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? I mean, so white is more, it's more than double. I think, you know, there's a lot of factors and we don't Absolutely. even have enough time to be able to go into <laughs> all the factors. But how important... Is it when when you look at these stats and everything else? How important is it for for people like yourself when choosing career paths? Because a lot of times, like I said, our parents have done the best that they can. Our parents might have told us, like, man, you go get a criminal justice degree, you become, you know, you can do that, or go, you know, education degree and become right. a teacher and everything else. And a lot of times, our 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 head of households who did go to school and did go to college and did whatever, man, the cap on the on what they can earn is very low especially how, compared to the tech. right yeah. so how important is it speaking to our audience here mm-hmm. especially speaking to parents where or school-aged kids that um you know that they, they might still have some influence on career paths for for us as black people in seattle to basically climb up this ladder from forty two thousand uh five hundred dollars mm-hmm. how important is is setting a career track towards you know uh what can be earned Right. And getting that straight early on. Um, well, when I look at the graph, what I see, uh, the two highest demographics are whites and Asians. And, you know, my time at Microsoft and visiting all these different campuses, what I've seen is that those are the two largest demographics that are employed at those companies. And so what that means is that in the tech field, these two demographics are the most populous and blacks are one of the least populous. And so that that graph is a direct representation of the the you know the demographics of the tech field in here just in here in Seattle because the tech industry is a large part of the Seattle economy. And so what you're seeing there is that you know a lot of these whites and Asians are achieving those you know median incomes because they're employed in these um, you know roles in all these different tech companies and black people just are not. And so I think that is a, a a major factor in what we see there. Right. And so you parents out there, I mean, this is something to keep in mind when, when you're talking to your children about career paths and everything else. And I know a lot of times we want to leave it up to our kids to, to choose their career path, but there's nothing wrong with really looking at these kind of things where, you know, when we talk about these tech and IT careers, I mean, you know, some some of these jobs, these guys are getting out of college and they're starting at 150, 160,000. Um, some other jobs, you know, the degrees that, that, that our, our youth are getting in colleges, I mean, those careers top out at 60000 They top out at 70000 So, I mean, you know, taking ownership of that itself when you're talking to your children about the careers that they choose is very important. Now, kind of on this same, um, this same thread here, there was also an article out that said that, like, man, black men have the, the, the biggest danger um, uh, when it comes to automation. Basically, our, our jobs are on the chopping block. Right. Our everyday jobs are on the chopping block because automation is going to replace a lot of the, the jobs that black men are doing as far as manual labor. Again, maybe elaborating more. I just want to reinforce this, that mm-hmm. you know it's important that a career path that, that people take, and it might not necessarily be tech, but a, that w- w- we're thinking about career paths that can't necessarily be replaced by a computer, at least in the near future. Right. So a lot of those jobs that are at risk of, you know, becoming irrelevant because of automation are simple task jobs. So like whether you're a a service person at a restaurant or fast food chain or you're doing assembly line work, um, which um, have large demographics of African-American men, those jobs are at risk. But the jobs that have low risk for being replaced are jobs that require creativity, uh, require you know leadership positions and things like that and so what I feel like is I feel like the um, the exposure that these men have and the access that these men have to developing these skills that are actually going to keep them from being replaced by robots 
uh, is, is, is an important thing, access to, to be able to develop yourself, access to those programs like Black Dot provides here in Seattle. Right. So now switching gears a bit, man, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? I, uh, the word is, is that you're, you're really big in community building and being able to open doors in, in tech. But I mean, you're, you're a living example of like what can happen um, in this field. Is there anything in particular that you're working on or, is, or how is it that you're opening doors and you're building awareness around tech opportunities, especially for other young black men and women? So right now what I'm focused on is creating another Mind the Block event for this upcoming winter break and for Seattle Public Schools. Um, the Mind the Block that we did earlier this year was a great event. Everything went well, but what I noticed is that it would have been even better if the kids had more time to you know, work on their craft and create what they wanted to create. And so I was looking at doing a, an extended version of that event uh, come this winter break that would give them the opportunity to create larger or more, ro more robust projects, so. Right, now um, you're aware of, of Africatown and all the initiatives that mm -hmm. we have going on and everything else. One of the things that we're really working towards over here is the repurposing of Fire Station 6, which is on 23rd and Yesler, mm -hmm. and ultimately turn it into the, the William Gross Center for Cultural uh, Innovation. Um, what are your thoughts on, on the repurposing of Fire Station 6 and also, you know, the development of like an innovation hub or innovation corridor here in the Central District? Uh, I think it's a great initiative. I think if youth had equal access to basketball courts and football fields as they had to innovation hubs, we'd see a lot more diversity in their uh, career aspirations. You know, everybody wouldn't just want to be like, well, I'm on the court playing basketball because that's what's here, that's what I like. They would see the tech hub and they'd be like, yeah, you know, I spent some time in there and I was creating this and, you know, I was really having fun, but also they were creating something. And so I think a space like that where they can just be themselves, create and explore what, th what interests them uh, would be a game changer. It would definitely be a game changer. Right, fantastic. So maybe you can tell us, uh, you're in college, so I'm sure you're reading a lot of books, mm -hmm. <laughs> but can you tell us um, three books that, um, that either you've read that have, that have influenced you or, or some books that you might be reading right now? Uh, so the first book that I ever read that really changed my outlook on life was The Art of War by Sun Tzu. Uh, that really just gave me um, more perspective on you know dealing with conflict, you know, you don't want to you don't want to go to war the the best the best war is the war that doesn't happen and that's the main teaching of that book another book is um <clears throat> the struggle continues by kwame nkrumah so kwame nkrumah was a leader uh, in ghana and he was facilitating uh, major infrastructural changes in ghana and he was doing great work and so that touches on a few of the struggles that he had and the things that he worked through and then a book that i'm currently reading now is um Never, oh shoot, it's uh, by Christopher Voss, it's called, um, hold on, let me get this, because y'all need this, this one is a jewel. I'm still reading it right now, that's why the title escapes me, but Never Split the Difference. That book, uh, it, it talks about negotiation, and so that's not only negotiating contracts or deals, but that's also just, you know, how do you talk to people and make sure that all parties are getting, you know, the best um, of what they can get out of, the, out of any exchange that you're having. So, Never Split the Difference by Christopher Voss. That's the one I'm reading now. All right, he's just a big endorsement there. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so a lot of times, um, when people talk about inspirations and things like that, as far as people who've inspired them, you know, sometimes people go into the past, like I'm inspired by the, the, the teachings of, you know, Martin Luther King and things like that. We want to keep things into the here and now. So can you, you name a few people who are living and breathing mm -hmm. and, you know, ideally who you actually interact with who are real life inspirations for you or, or people that, you know what I'm saying, motivate you by their actions or mm -hmm. just overall inspire you? So number one, Kanye West, although I don't interact with him, he's somebody that continues to create uh, no matter what kind of you know, hardships he faces, no matter what anybody else says, he always gets out his ideas. And uh, I really respect that and I feel like as long as you wanna create and you wanna show people um, 
your vision and what you th how you think you can improve the world, I think creating is a great thing and it's a good attitude to have. Uh, the second person, John Henry, I actually had the opportunity to meet him when I attended Afrotech and he um, he's a co-founder of Harlem Capital, which is a, a venture capital fund in Harlem that um, so venture capital is essentially um, it's like an organization that funds startups and so if you have a good idea they'll give you money and you better execute because if you don't execute it's going to be problems but they're pretty good at deciding if you're going to execute or not and they give you the money accordingly uh, so him you know he does things not only did he do that but he has other he has a nonprofit initiative that does a similar thing in terms of venture capital funding uh, and then uh, Jessica Matthews, I also had the opportunity to meet her at Afrotech, and she works in energy. So she has a, a corporation that she founded, or a company that she founded called Uncharted Play. And what they do is they create solutions for uh, energy generation through, it stores energy, like kinetic Jessica, energy. I know Jessica, she has mm -hmm. the, the soccer ball. Yeah. I, I met Jessica in New York. Yeah, yeah. She has her, her Uncharted Plays office. She mm -hmm. actually moved to Harlem. Yep, uh, so, yeah, right up there in Harlem. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I know. She's from Nigeria originally, right? Yep. Yeah, okay. Look at you. got some good inspirations. Yeah. This is big bosses, huh? Yeah. So sure. are, are you finding time? Are you, are you one of these people who are on podcasts and things like that? Is there any, any podcasts that you follow or YouTube channels? Two Black Guys With Good Credit. That's the one that I've listened to the most. All right now. And then we got the breakdown with Sean King. And so those are the two podcasts that I've spent time listening to. And yeah. Okay, fantastic. So b before we get out of here, it's mm -hmm. one thing we want to do is we want to get that golden nugget, that nugget of information, especially for parents who might might be watching this right now, who still have school aged children and they're like, Man, what are steps, what are some of the first small steps that they might be able to take? One, either exposing their children to tech or trying to, you know, find different events or any things that they might be able to do at home. Mm -hmm. what, what, what are some nuggets of advice or gems, I'd like to say, that you can offer? Right. So a lot of the kids in our community, really just all around the country, but especially in our community, go unmonitored when they're playing video games. And, you know, I love video games personally. I'm not going to knock them. But it's important to have a balance between, you know, consuming and playing. So you don't want to always just be consuming content that other people create. But you want to, um, you know, push your kids to create something, uh, whether they're drawing or whether they're actually learning how to code. Just push them to create something. And if they don't know what to create, you can say, hey, well, since you like video games, you should check this tutorial out online. Code.org has plenty of tutorials. You can go to Code Academy, that's codeacademy.com, and they have tutorials where you can just get started and get learning, you know, and see if you're interested in coding. But exposing them to, to you know, seeing whether or not they're interested is better than just having them never touch it. And so I think that's an important thing. Making sure that you're really, you know, especially if you have young children that can't take their own initiative, to really look for events that they can participate in, um, you know, to develop their interest in technology or, um, you know, whatever it is, but especially technology, make sure that you find in those opportunities for them because that's going to help them, um, you know, get on the right trajectory. All right. Fantastic. Amari Garrett, thank you so much for checking in yes, with sir. us here, man. And we're wishing you the best of luck of in your career. Okay. Appreciate you. All right. Until next time, it's the big O and I'm out.